When you play a game with a three-year-old, you quickly learn that the rules are, let's call it fluid. I was reminded of that this week when I got to play several games with my granddaughter, Lily. Hi, Lily. I'll give you an example. She wanted to play what she calls soccer ball. So we went outside, we were in the front yard, and she found the middle of the yard and she put down the ball. She put her fingers in her mouth, woo hoo, blew the whistle, and we began to kick the ball back and forth across the yard. At one point, she stopped and she said, this is how you win. You kick the ball into those bushes. I said, okay, easy enough. And so she reared back and kicked the ball as hard as she could, and it went the opposite direction across the sidewalk. At which point she smiled that beguiling, beautiful smile that she has, and she said, and that's how you win. You kick it across the sidewalk. I win, I get the trophy. Now, if it had been anyone other than my precious darling granddaughter, I would have called foul. Because I like to know the rules have been firmly established at the beginning of the game and know where we're going. Whether it's a board game or a sports game or simply the game of life, I like to know the rules because rules are important, right? In families, in workplaces, in classrooms, in the world, rules provide structure and they keep us safe. The founder of the United Methodist Church, you remember who that was, right? John Wesley, very good. John Wesley thought it was important to have some rules for the folks that were the early Methodists. When he gathered them in his, what he called, uniting societies, he came up with some rules that would guide their life together and guide the way that they lived out their faith as individuals. These rules were rules of holy living that would renew the communities, renew the individuals, and Wesley felt like they were important. And it was out of that sea of these uniting societies, living with each other according to the rules, that a powerful movement of the Holy Spirit sprang up and a new denomination was formed. Wesley called them his general rules, three general rules. They were simple, easy to remember. Do no harm, do good, Attend to the ordinances of God. Okay, that last one's not so easy to understand or remember. So for the purpose of our sermon series, we're using the titles that Bishop Reuben Job gave in the book he wrote about the general rules. Do no harm, do good, stay in love with God. Say that with me. Do no harm, do good, stay in love with God. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to explore these three simple rules and figure out what they teach us about how to live as Christian people and how to live together in the community of faith and in our world. Today's rule, the first one, is do no harm. And when I began to think about uh, the sermon, I decided I wanted to know what Wesley meant by that. And so... What I did was go to the source. No, I didn't talk to John Wesley. He's been dead for a really long time. I went to this source, the United Methodist Book of Discipline. It is the guidebook for our life together as United Methodists. And it is filled with rules about how to do everything in the church. And if you ever get insomnia, let me know and I'll lend you my copy. But there's some really cool stuff at the beginning of this book where it lists out our beliefs and our doctrines. If you want to know what we believe as United Methodists, read the first part of the United Methodist Book of Discipline. And part of what it includes are several pages on Wesley's three general rules. And What I love about it is it's not just someone writing about it, it's Wesley himself. It's an excerpt from something that he wrote in 1808. 
And Wesley says that to do no harm means to avoid evil of every kind, especially that which is generally practiced. So think for a moment. What are some evils you think Wesley might want us to avoid so that we can do no harm? Well, don't worry. He gives a long, long list in the book. I want to read a few of them for you. Avoid taking the name of the Lord in vain, profaning the day of the Lord, drunkenness, slaveholding, buying or selling slaves, fighting, quarreling, brawling. That's pretty easy so far, right? You could have guessed those. You probably do avoid those. Then it gets interesting. Uncharitable or unprofitable conversation particularly speaking evil of magistrates and ministers. Be careful about what you say at the Grove or Napoleon's today while you're at lunch. Softless and needless self-indulgence, laying up treasure on earth, putting on gold or costly apparel, ouch. The last two sum up all of his list. Doing what we know is not for the glory of God and doing to others what we would not have them do to us. That sounds very similar to what Bob just read in the book of Romans, right? Paul's writing to the Romans and he's instructing them and instructing us on how to live with each other And he says that the only thing we owe is a debt of love. We're called to love one another. It's not a friendly suggestion. He says it is a command. We are commanded to love one another. And that we are commanded to love each other in a way that fulfills all the law and the prophets. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's hard, isn't it? I don't know about you, but some of the folks that I know are not as easy to love as others. But it's helpful to understand what the Bible means by love. It is not that warm, fuzzy feeling that we see, you know, in the movies. When the Bible talks about love, it's agape love. It's the kind of love that God has. A love that's a choice, that's a decision to work for the other person's best good. When we love someone, We act and speak in ways that help them. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's also interesting to note that Paul's idea of neighbor is not the person who lives down your street or in your condo complex. That Paul's idea of neighbor is broader than that. It looks like Jesus' idea of neighbor. You remember the story where Jesus tells us who our neighbors are, right? A teacher of the law comes to Jesus and asks him, how do I inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. And the teacher, in a desire to uh, justify himself and maybe even trip up Jesus, asks, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus answers with one of the most beloved stories in the Bible, the story of the Good Samaritan, a story that is very clear that our neighbor is broader than just the people in our community or the people who are like us, that neighbor is every person on the planet and might even be the other, the outcast, the enemy. Everyone, according to Jesus, is our neighbor. Reuben Job in his book talks about this, and he talks about how we are to think about doing no harm in relationship to our neighbor. He says, to do no harm means that I will be on guard so that all my actions and even my silence will not add injury to another of God's children or any part of creation. Instead, I will determine to live every day of my life always invested in the effort to bring healing 
instead of hurt, wholeness instead of division, and harmony with the ways of Jesus rather than the ways of the world. It's that call to do no harm, to see people like Jesus sees people, with the eyes that God uses, eyes that see the best in others and want the best in others, eyes that see every person as a beloved and precious child of God. Imagine, imagine what it would be like in our world if everybody could see the other person in that way, see their value and their worth. It would transform the world. Because every ism, every evil, every injustice, every oppression, every harm has at its root the lie that the other is somehow of less value. Jesus didn't look at people that way. You read the Gospels and Jesus is always acting in loving ways for the other person's best interest. Jesus is always seeing the best and working for the other person's best. And that's what Jesus calls us to do. That's what it means to love our neighbor. So what might it look like if we were to love our neighbor as ourself? I think the first thing that it would look like is a lot of introspection and reflection. Because doing no harm is not always simple to see. Oh, they're the big ten. We, we know about those big things, the things that Paul and Wesley have in common. Don't, don't steal. Don't kill anybody. Don't commit adultery. Come on, folks. That harms people, right? But there are more subtle ways that we harm people when we engage in gossip that undermines someone's reputation. When we speak a word in anger that rips at the fabric of relationship. When we buy into the notion of us, them, that devalues another person. There are ways that we subtly harm people, and we have to be attentive to that. So what does do no harm living look like? It might look like treating the custodian with the same respect you treat the CEO. It might look like rethinking how we do mission to make sure that we're in mission with people instead of in mission to people, and that we're looking for their worth and value and seeking to see what we might learn from them. It might look like changing the way that we act and speak about and to those who stand on the different side of the issue from us. What's the issue? Pick any issue and think about what it might look like to love the person who thinks differently than we do as Jesus would, even as we might disagree. This past week at Salem Camp Meeting, Dr. Bill Britt told a story in one of his sermons that I thought was a great illustration of this. It was during his Doctor of Ministry studies, and they put the group in cohorts. So you meet a lot of times with the same small group of people over several years. And his group was a mixture of African-American pastors and Caucasian pastors. And he said on this particular day, they'd had a a very heated, um, emotional kind of lesson uh, as they had watched Schindler's List and talked about it. And after that class time was over, they gathered at the table together for dinner. And it happened that the African-American pastor sat on one end and the Caucasian pastor sat on the other end. And one group of pastors was having a heated discussion and and a person was pounding the table as they made their point. And Bill said, the silverware just kind of jumped off the table every time he pounded. 
And finally, after a while and exasperation, one of the folks on the other end of the table said, hey, we're trying to eat down here. And suddenly there was silence. Not the comfortable silence, but you know the kind, the, the kind that is laced with tension. And as the silence went on, people began to speak calmly at first and then with more heated, animated comments until finally both groups picked up their trays and walked in separate directions. The next day, they began to talk to each other and apologize and they were mortified by their actions. They said, we're Christians. This isn't how Christians act and we're preachers. This certainly isn't how preachers act. They went to their professor to confess what they had done and to ask for his insight. And he said the most surprising thing. He said, I'm so glad that happened. What? Glad that happened? He said, yes, because it only happened because you were at the table together. And next time, you will do it differently. Maybe doing no harm is as simple as being at the table together, looking for the things we have in common, and treating the other person with sacred worth. It reminds me of the words from one of Paul's other letters, 1 Corinthians, when he talks about what love is. You know the words. Say them with me. Love is patient and kind. Love is not envious or boastful or rude. Love does not seek its, what, own way? It is not irritable. It does not keep a record of wrongs, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. And I think Wesley would add, love does no harm. My friends, as you go into your week, go out to love your neighbor, all the neighbors in the world. Pray that God would show you where you might be doing harm, intentionally or unintentionally, and then have the courage to hear that and to make an adjustment. Go. Do no harm.